Okay. All right. Beautiful faces coming into the room. I'm going to take a little drink of water and give some more folks a chance just to come on in. They can sure enter later. It's a beautiful day out there and it's time to wish everybody happy spring. So there's a greeting I know many of us have been waiting for. Happy spring. Woohoo. All right. So welcome to the room, everybody. It's another beautiful day. I'm Tess Hoke. I am a garden educator and I'm a real food mentor. And I call what I do yard food. I grow food in my yard and I teach anybody who's interested how to do it too. So follow me along the garden path, go see what I'm up to and follow along. You can do this too, I know you've got this. So uh, today our yard food session is happy starts. And what we're gonna do is look at our garden starts that many of us have growing in our windowsill. We're gonna look at them, see what the next steps are to take, look at some critical needs that they've got we don't wanna miss out on, maybe check in with some issues that we've got going on, and get everything up and running so that we can arrive at the finish line at planting season with happy, healthy starts. So we're gonna get into that, but before we do, just let me go over a couple rules of the road, how we're gonna run our room today. So you have been muted as you've come into the classroom. And that's not because I don't wanna hear your beautiful voice. We are gonna open things up to a Q&A later on. It just makes for a much better presentation and less interruptions for everybody. So at the end of the session today, we'll open it up for a Q&A and we'll do that by having you raise your hand icon. And one by one, we're gonna come along through the room, unmute your microphone, give you the floor, and give you a chance to ask your questions. Talk about whatever issues might be showing up for you and your garden starts. Um, allow you to participate in the conversation. I'm sure you guys have got a lot of really good ideas, things that have been successful and worked for you. So make sure that you bring that to the table too. It's really good to have everybody's input today. So there's that. Last thing, um, I want you to know that I am here today to empower you with information so that you can learn to grow your food. Now, whether you're here because you wanna save money at the grocery store or you wanna have access to um, healthy, nutrient-dense food or because you know that this skill set, growing your food, lies at the center of a strong and sustainable community, Whatever your goal is today, I am here to empower you to achieve that. Now, if you find value in what I'm offering, if it brings value to your life, please do consider making a donation to my work. This is how I am supporting myself in this modern world, and it will allow me to continue to do what I do for you. So I think we have swept the floor here today. I think we are all ready to go. It's about time to strap ourselves in and get ready. We've got some garden starts that are gonna need our attention. So what I wanna share with you guys today is what our little garden starts are needing. Like I said, they are at a critical stage in their development and there's some key things that we need to be aware of so that we can give them what they need so they can later on give us what we need. But here's a more important thing that I want to share with you today. I want to help you learn an ability, a way so that you can do this yourself, so that you can interpret the information that our little seedlings are really providing you and know what to do next. And we're gonna do that by learning a new word, a word that I learned this week myself. And let's see if I can pronounce it correctly. Persificacious. And what that word means, it's a mouthful, but what it means is the ability to see and act from another's point of view. And that's what I wanna teach you how to see and act from our seedlings point of view. And here's how this whole thing works. You are a biological creature. You're made up of all sorts of things from this planet and your garden starts are a biological creature too. You have physical needs. You need things like food and water and so do your garden starts. And you dear one have goals for your life 
And believe it or not, your garden starts have goals for their life too. Now, I know that you've got a lot of goals and you are doing a lot of really cool things in this world, but one of your goals, and I know it because you're here with me today, one of your goals is to learn to grow your garden. Whether that's you wanna grow your food or your flowers or your herbs, you're here with that goal in mind. Our garden starts have a goal. Their goal may be a slightly different than yours, but their goal is just as real. Their goal is to bear their seeds, to grow their seeds for the next generation so that their genetics can continue to exist year after year after year. That's what's so amazing to me about the garden is that everything in the garden has a goal. It is on a mission to accomplish something in its life. The soil is on a mission to accomplish whatever it's doing. The birds and the trees, the plants that are growing in the garden bed, even those weeds growing along my garden path, everything has a goal. It's on a mission, usually to reproduce itself. But in that system, everything has got a symbiotic relationship. In the process of it achieving its goal, it is also benefiting another along the way. And that's where you and I and our garden starts come in. This is a win-win deal for everybody in the garden. You give me what I need, I'm gonna give you what you need. I'm gonna provide you the care and you're gonna grow my tomatoes. I'm gonna care for you with everything I've got an ability to do and you are gonna provide me big, beautiful, luscious, juicy red tomatoes. So good, in fact, that I'll wanna save your seeds so that I can grow them next year and have these beautiful tomatoes again. Win-win, see how this works? Everything in the garden works to benefit another. Gardening is really a relationship with another species. And so I wanna share that with you, but taking it today from the point of view of this species, of our garden stars. Okay, persificacious, gardening from another's point of view. So let's see how we can apply that whole concept to our garden starts today. Now, if you were with me in a past class that we did several weeks ago, we started our garden seeds together. We talked about the things that our little seeds were gonna need in order to get to today's point, where we're at a really critical stage and we need to offer them some, um, some new space, some new food, et cetera, et cetera. But we're gonna get to all of that. If you didn't get that class and you haven't started your seeds yet and you're thinking you'd like to, do know that it's not too late for a lot of things. So go ahead and start your seeds. I encourage you to do so. If you feel that this past class that we took, seed starting, would be helpful for you, remind me later and I will send you a link. Um, also, you guys are gonna get a recording of this class sent to your inbox tomorrow. I'd be happy to also include that link of our earlier seed starting class so that if you haven't started seeds yet, you haven't missed out. So let's take a look at our seedlings. Let's see where they are in time and space and how we can interpret some cues that these little guys are presenting so that we're gonna know what to do for them next. Now, let's see, I started with you guys way back when some tomato starts. And one of the things that we talked about when our little seedlings were going to emerge from the soil was this. The first little leaves that were gonna come up were called cotyledons. They weren't true leaves, they were just literally the first leaves that come up that are essentially an energy pack. It's how nature puts energy inside of a seed so that that little seedling has a place to start growing. It needs a little kickstart to get itself down this road of life. And those first little leaves, they aren't true leaves, they don't look like a tomato leaf per se, but they were cotyledons. And they were there to provide energy for our plant. It was gonna send down a little root and begin to grow its real leaves up above. So when I take a peek at my tomato starts here today, I look at those cotyledon leaves, and maybe you're gonna notice this too in your seedlings. Those first leaves that came out, those cotyledons, are starting to get a little limey green. They're not quite so vibrant looking. And even some of these here today look like they're turning brown on the edges and getting little spots. Should I say to myself, oh no, some of my leaves are not looking so good? 
Or should I look at it from the point of view of my tomato plant? This cotyledon was his energy bar. He's been gobbling that energy up for weeks now, preparing himself for what's coming today. He's used all that energy up. And so it, is, it makes sense that those little leaves, those cotyledons are beginning to wither and die up. He doesn't need them anymore because he's used that energy. It's like when you and I eat an energy bar from the store, we gobble up the bar and what's left is the wrapper. We got, you know, wobble it up and put it away. It doesn't have any purpose for us anymore. And that's what these cotyledon leaves are indicating. He's done, he's used the energy, we're moving along. So I've got to think, all right, it's a biological creature. I get hungry every day. I imagine this little fellow is gonna get hungry. So I'm beginning to think fertilizing might be something I need to address. But before we get to that, let's look at all of this. Remember, we started our seedlings in a small little container. And these guys have come up. I kind of overplanted here. There's several of them in each little cell. But you can see that there's a bunch of them and they're all starting to get a little bit on the crowded side. Remember, we want to, our goal is to like, have this little fellow grow along the garden path, so to speak, without interruption, without getting stunted because it spent too long in a small pot. It's spending a lot of its energy growing a root base so that it can grow an upper top. So it's telling me it's time to get into a bigger pot. All right. I've got a four inch pot. Now this is a standard size pot that nurseries use all over the place. You might have some of these in your tool room. And so I suggest use them, but you don't have to. I'll tell you, you can open up your cupboard and go through your recycle bin and find some little container that'll work. It just needs to have drainage in the bottom and a room enough so that it's gonna give our little seedling room to develop its root growth. So again, a four inch size is a great size to get started in, and that's what I'm gonna use today. We're gonna need some soil, and this is potting soil. What we started our little seedlings in was not potting soil. We started them in something called a seedling soil. And just to refresh the difference there, seedling soil was made up of, let's see, I think it was like coconut core, and um, sphagnum moss and maybe some yucca extract. I think those were the ingredients. And those were formulated specifically to help a seed get started, sort of wicks away any extra moisture for it and, and really provided the perfect start for seeds. But what worked here isn't gonna work for our next little pot up. What we need is actual soil, a soil structure so that these little guys can begin to set themselves and grow in what they're going to be growing out later on in the garden. Something that's more of a soil. So if you're moving them from this size to the next, potting soil is your next choice. All right, so here's what I like to do. Um, let's see. Now, I'm going to show you how I do it. You can do it however you want, but the goal is to provide these perfect conditions for our little starts. So let's think about this. I'm going to put some soil in the bottom of this container, and I'm going to fill my container about halfway full. I don't know if you can see that, but give me a visual here. We've got a pot with half full of soil. And then I'm going to add some fertilizer. Now, this is a fertilizer. This is a Dr. Earth organic fertilizer. I love them because there's no chemicals in them. It's uh, not so easy to, you know, overfeed and burn your little plants by giving them too much fertilizer. But I always, and I stress this, because even though this is organic and not chemical in nature, you can still overdo it and burn your baby plants. So always do me a favor and read the directions on the back of the pack. And this little fellow says that for every four inch size pot, I want to add one to two tablespoons of fertilizer. So I've got my little teaspoon and I took a cooking class way back when and learned that there's three teaspoons for every tablespoon. So I'm just going to make a scoop for what I think is a tablespoon. And I'm going to put it right on top of the soil that's half full in my pot. 
And then what I'm gonna do is mix it in. And what I'm mixing in and why I'm doing that is the next little thing that's gonna happen is my roots for my plants are gonna set on top of this soil. And I don't want them to set right on top of the fertilizer. Because again, even though this is an organic fertilizer, it's super possible to burn these tender little roots. And I don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna fill that up, mix that in, and then I'm gonna to top my pot off so that that fertilizer that I put in that pot you can see is now down here in the center of the pot where the roots are gonna end up. So let's just set this aside for a moment. We're gonna come back to that and let's look at our seedlings. All right, so these were some tomato seedlings. I think they were called Moneymaker, if I recalled. I love that name. And I'm just gonna give my little pot a gentle squeeze on the bottom and gently bring this all out as a cell. Do me a favor and just take a look at your developing roots. How are they looking to you? Do you see a root structure going? If you do, this little fellow is talking to you and he's saying to you, you're doing a good job. So I'm looking for a nice little beginning root structure to form. And remember, the roots are very tender at this stage. So be very, very gentle. They're little babies. And we don't want to upset the cart before it's necessary. So what do you do if you've got more than one plant in your cell? Now this is totally up to you. You can do something called pricking them out by either pulling them out or snipping them off with a pair of scissors and just keeping one. Or, this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to gently, because I want every seedling that I've got here today, I've got friends I've promised these to, so i got to keep my word, and I'm just going to gently massage the soil, just enough so that I can gently pull one from another, and that's working. Now, let me tell you something, should you accidentally break one or pull its top off from its root, the guy's done, the little baby's finished. But don't feel bad, you did your best. The thing I love about mistakes is that you always learn from them. And then you begin to feel how gentle you need to be with your little fellows. All right, back to our pot. I've got a beautiful little seedling here with a beautiful little root structure beginning to grow. Let's give you a look at that, you can see. That's what you're looking for for optimal growth there. When you go to transplant, look for this beautiful root system. If you don't have it, well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's focus one thing at a time here for this little girl. And I've just sort of dug a little hole in there with my two fingers and sort of worked it down, oh gosh, maybe to this middle knuckle here. That's kind of my rule of thumb. Dug a hole to my middle knuckle, set my little fellow in the root with his root down into that hole and then I'm gently, just gently, tucking him in. I don't want to compress it, because remember, I don't want to crush that new little root system. I just want to gently place him in there and press him in. And you can see there how far down I placed him. His little cotyledons, those little early leaves, are beginning to yellow, and those will as time goes by, turn brown and then wither. And remember, we're not gonna worry about that because we know that that purpose has been done. It's used the energy from those cotyledons. So there's that, but let's do this again and let's do it with a tomato that maybe has an issue or two. One of the things that we talked about in our earlier seed class was the need for our seedlings to get ample light. We talked, we stressed that we needed 14 to 16 hours of light, of good, bright, growing light for our seedlings to get everything they needed to be yummy and sweet and stocky and healthy. But sometimes in life, you just can't give everything what it needs and you just do your best. So that's good. There's always ways that we can correct things along the way. So we've got some beautiful little tomato starts creatively started in egg cartons. I love that idea, it works well. But some of these little guys are a little long and lanky. I'm gonna scoop one out with my little spoon just to keep him happy and trying not to disturb his roots. Because remember, 
He's using those to grow himself. And I'm going to show you. He's younger, so he doesn't have quite as much growth yet. But look how long that stem is. You see that? If your seedlings are starting to be long and lanky and their necks are getting very long, chances are they're reaching through your windows towards your sun. They're trying to get more light for themselves. So we do what we can and there's some solutions that I can share coming along. But now we've got to transplant him up and we're going to transplant him up because he's got his first real set of tomato leaves starting to grow. He's speaking to you. I'm putting on my real set of leaves. I've used up the energy in my cotyledon. I need more room for my roots and I need food for my leaves. Now, one of the reasons that this guy may have a sm slightly smaller root system than this little fellow is that it was a shallower container that he was growing in. That's okay. We're going to rectify that now by giving him a larger container. And this is what I'm going to do with a long, lanky stem. And I'd like you to be able to do this too. We're going to transplant him in a slightly different way. I'm going to put soil at the bottom. Actually, let's do one thing first. Let's, let's just back that up. We've got soil. This time, instead of putting the soil in the pot for this little fellow, I'm going to add the appropriate amount to my potting soil, a tablespoon for every four inch pot, and I'm gonna mix it in so that it's all in that soil. Okay, you can do that too, however you wanna do it, but that's another way. But now I've got some of that fertilized soil in the bottom of my pot, just in the bottom, because what I wanna do is give this guy an opportunity, this little fella, this little girl, we're not sure yet, um, Give her an opportunity to grow more roots. And the thing about many vegetable starts, and this is a great tip to put in your gardening tool belt for later, but many vegetable starts will root themselves along the stem as long as that stem is buried in soil. So we've got long, lanky stems, many of us, because we're just not getting enough light at the window. So let's take advantage of what we know we can correct, what this little guy is now telling us, and bury the stem as deep as we can so that one, we give this little guy a chance to grow a bigger root system, and two, we give him a little bit more stability. Watch what I mean. I've set him down low into the pot. I've set him down low all the way, it's kind of hard to see, I know, but all the way to the tippy top there. And now I'm gonna put the soil ever so gently, I'm gonna place that soil around that stem. I'm holding that stem so it doesn't fall or break. If it breaks, well, we'll just have to start another. And he's literally burying himself, or I'm burying him, up to the neck. I'm just gently going to press that in. There's fertilizer now in all of that soil where his roots are. And there's fertilizer in the soil along the stem so that he can grow roots out of there and make an even bigger root ball for later growth. Do you see that? All of that long lanky stem has been buried. And this little guy is happy because he's going to be able to form roots along that stem. I love that idea. And again, most vegetables appreciate that. You can grow roots along the stems of most vegetables when you're transplanting them. All right, so then let's do a different vegetable plant and maybe look at it a little bit different. Whoa, look at this. This is a parsley little cell that you and I started together. Um, it was a coconut core compressed little fellow that you soaked in water and he puffed up and he made a planting pot. And it looks to me like I put quite a few little seeds in there because I wanted to make sure I had plenty of parsley. So he's got roots growing out of the bottom. I don't want to like pull him out because I don't want to damage his roots. So how can we do that? Well, let's see. I've never used one of these before, so we're fixing this together, you and I. I think what I'm gonna do is take a pair of scissors and just cut down along the side and open him up. Oh yeah. 
There he is. And if you break some of the roots as you do your little projects, don't worry, just keep on going. Nature is amazing. She's quite forgiving from time to time. And um, I have learned that over the course of time, things usually work out. Okay, like I said, I'm massaging this and I'm gently pulling these apart. Come on, little guys. Come on, let's let go of one another. I know you've been together for a while, but let's just let go of one another. Okay, so there they are, semi-separated. Now these are parsleys, and if you're growing parsley or some of your other herbs from seed, they're not, not quite so finicky about needing a full-size pot for themselves. So, since I've got several, what I'm going to do is plant maybe three of them to each of my four inch pot. So I like the idea of putting some soil about halfway into the bottom, putting my tablespoon of fertilizer into my container, and mixing it in. Okay, and then I'm going to fill the container up to the top. All right, so one by one, I'm gonna plant maybe three of these little guys into my pot. And you see his little root system starting to grow? So one, I'm gonna stick him in a hole that I buried or made with my finger and bury him right up to those cotyledons, that first little set. I'm gonna make another hole. Wow, look at that little guy. Look at his little root system. Isn't life amazing? They really do. All of these little guys want to be with you in the garden. And they're getting to know you. Every time you come to the windowsill with your water and your fertilizer, don't let me forget to tell us how often to fertilize, but every time they see you coming, and research shows this is true, they recognize you. They know you. They sense you. They communicate in a different way, perhaps, than you and I, but they communicate. They're alive. They're biological. They have goals. Okay, there's three little parsleys in a pot. I love that. Let's go back and do one more again, just so that we got this whole thing straight. I'm going to plant another tomato. And these tomatoes are looking quite happy actually. Um, I get lucky these little guys have been growing in this greenhouse. So for them, 14 to 16 hours of light a day is not a problem. But I understand we're not all there. Everybody doesn't have a beautiful greenhouse to grow it in. So we do the best we can. I know we talked last time about supplemental lighting, about getting some sort of grow light system. And while that is an investment, maybe this year, once you've started and you're learning how to do this, you can see the value of having access to more light. So think about that. Here's another tomato. Look at that beautiful root system. I'm doing my best not to disturb it. These cotyledons were those early leaves that started they're long and they look different than the tomato leaves that are coming out now and they're starting to yellow. But we know it's only because this little guy has used up the energy that was placed there by the amazing ma'am called nature and it was put there to be used by that seedling to jumpstart its life. Gently pressing that down and voila. Okay, so one of the things also, so now we've got them potted in their little four inch pots. They're gonna be able to grow out from this point forward, but we don't wanna to forget to water them. Now, when we had seedlings in our little trays, when we were beginning to do that, often just spritzing like this was enough water. But these little guys are getting much bigger. They're eating more, they're drinking more, as I'm sure you're beginning to notice. So we're gonna have to figure out some creative way 
of making sure they're getting ample moisture and then not oozing all over our windowsills. What is that? Well, one of the things that I like to use are these nursery trays, and maybe you've seen them and you've got some of them in your tool shed. It's quite easy to line them with some sort of plastic material or saran wrap or something that's not going to leak, and then place your seedlings in those trays. Now, that's another thing about growing your starts indoors, is now that we're moving them up to bigger pots, we're beginning to see how much room these little guys are starting to occupy indoors. So we're just gonna have to get creative and figure out ways that's gonna work for us. And one of the things I like about being creative and figuring out what's working and what's not working is just that. Sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And when they don't, we figure out ways to fix it. At least we're given an opportunity to do so. So try that on for size. All right, if you have planted onions, I get this question a lot and I wanted to share this with you because one of the things that I started with you in that earlier seed class was onion seeds. And look at these sweet little babies. They're getting long, they're getting lanky, and they're starting to flop over. Well, to me, or excuse me, onions are slightly different than other plants. And don't try this with tomatoes or parsley or anything. We're just gonna do it today with our onions. And that is, these little guys love a haircut. It'll keep them from getting too long and lanky and I'm just gonna take a pair of scissors and I'm gonna trim off the tops of my onions, maybe down, I don't know, an inch or so. What I wanna make sure of is I don't cut them so close to the bottom that I've cut off that little growing top. Onions grow from the center out, and so I'm not worried that the haircut that I'm giving them is going to impede their growth at all. I know that once they get transplanted out into the garden, they're gonna send up lots of new growth from the center out. But at least for now, it's gonna give them an opportunity to continue growing along in my windowsill without being so long and lanky. So I love to just give them a simple little haircut. And if you're growing onion seeds and got your onions growing and they're doing this too, don't worry. You can sure give them a trim. Remember, when we get a haircut at the barber, our hair doesn't grow from the bottom. It grows from the top out and that's kind of how the onions are growing too. See how that is? seeing things from the onion's point of view. All right, I think we got that. Don't be afraid to give your onions a haircut. I've also got a little tomato that showed up out of the blue growing in the middle of the onions and I promised him that when I was teaching you guys about giving the haircut to the onions that I would do my best to prick him out. I'm just sort of gently loosening. I don't want to mess with my onions too much, but I want to get him out of there. So I just sort of lifted him and I'm doing my best, see? Doing my best to just pull him out without disturbing him too much. It's nice and fluffy soil, so out he's come. And there he is, see? Now he was growing in a shallower container it's not much soil in there. The onions are doing fine, but he could have used a little more depth, but that's okay. He's going to forgive me. And, um, and so his root system is not quite so intense, so beautiful. But we're going to give him a chance to grow some more roots by putting some soil in the bottom of my container, adding a little bit of fertilizer, and mixing it in. Let's talk about fertilizers for a second. I like to use organic. I'm a girl who takes, is very serious about the food that I'm putting in my body. And I know that there is a lot of chemicals in our food system. I'm not here to make judgments. I'm just here to share information. And so if I'm going to all of this effort, and if you're going to all of the effort too, why not spend your money and get an organic fertilizer. They're easier to use 
You can, but it's harder to overfeed them and kill them. And you're not gonna get the chemicals ingested in your body. A little plant growing in a chemical fertilizer or chemical soils is going to absorb that into a structure and then it's going to create that into the food that it offers you. So if you ask me, organic is always the best way to go. A little bit of water, a little bit of drink. You're gonna notice as these plants start to grow bigger and bigger that they're gonna be thirstier and thirstier and kind of calling your name a little more often than they used to. But be prepared for that, it's just part of the deal. Okay, transplanting. We've looked at it from the point of view of our tomato starts here, for example. We've been able to determine what it is that they needed, right? They're done with their cotyledons. They're putting on a true leaf, a sign that they're ready to get moved up to a larger pot. And we've done that, we fertilized them. We're gonna need to make sure that we continue to fertilize these as they're growing along. How often? That's gonna depend on the kind of fertilizer that you're using. But just give it a read on the back of the package. I'm gonna fertilize mine, I don't know, probably every couple, three weeks now. But I'm gonna pay attention because I know the plant can communicate with me. And if the leaves of these little new tomato starts are starting to turn a limey green, it's speaking. It is saying to us, please give me more food. So watch for those signs, all right? Then let's move along the garden path. Time goes along. We're going to continue to water our plants. We're gonna to continue to make sure that inside our home, they're getting as much sunlight as possible. Sometimes this means that we gotta move them around the house, but that's just part of the deal. Um, there's some ways that we can do, maybe add some supplemental light a little bit later, but we're not quite there yet. So we're gonna continue to monitor these things and we're gonna make sure that they get as much light as we can possibly give them. Then what we're going to do is look towards planting season. Now, in our earlier class, we covered the question, how do I know when to plant my starts outside? And let's just refresh that again. There's something called the last frost date. It is a chart of information that has been accumulated by researchers and home gardeners all across this globe to give us sort of a ballpark guess on when the last frost in our spring of a particular area is going to occur and the first frost is going to happen in the fall. Now granted, it's just a ballpark, but at least gives us something to shoot at, right? So where I'm living and where I'm growing my garden, I know based on this information from this chart that the last frost date for me is the last week of May for my tomatoes, for my warm weather crops. So what I'm gonna do is a very critical step 10 days to two weeks before that planting time. And it's called hardening off. And this must happen or your seedlings are gonna suffer. Hardening off literally means beginning to acclimate my little friends to the out of doors. So about two weeks, 10 days or so before my last frost date, I'm going to take my tray of seedlings and I'm gonna take them outside. But I'm not gonna take them anywhere outside. I'm gonna find a very sheltered place where the wind is not gonna blow and I'm gonna find a place where the direct sun is not gonna shine. And the reason I'm looking for those two places is really important and think about it from your seedlings point of view. This little guy has been growing indoors. Like you and I, when we've been indoors all winter and we go out into the hot sun for the first time, what happens to our skin? It burns. The same thing happens to our little biological creature's leaves. If he goes directly from indoors to out into the hot sun, we risk burning his little leaves. That's why we're looking for a place that's shaded. The same thing is true with the wind. He's not stable yet. He doesn't have a real strong system. He's gonna, he's gonna get that, but we don't wanna just throw him off to the wolves to start with. So do me a favor. Those first couple days that we're going to start hardening our little plants off, taking them out of doors, let's make sure that we think about that and we remember. Sheltered out of the sun and the wind. Now gradually, 
And also, don't forget to bring them in at the end of the day, okay? That's happened to me before and it's not pretty. And it's a way to just totally destroy all of the work that you've got so far. So, sheltered from the sun and the wind. Then gradually, over that course of a couple of weeks, begin to bring them out a little bit more into maybe partial sunlight or dappled sun, maybe in under a tree on a day when the wind isn't blowing. But you're looking to slowly and gently acclimate your little seedlings to more and more sun and wind, all right? Sun and the exposure of whatever elements may be out there. And they'll respond. What you'll start to see is thicker, sturdier stems because they're responding to the environment. And you'll start to see more vibrant, luscious leaf growth and probably even more leaf growth to boot. So you'll know you're on the road to success. But hardening off is critical and it must be done or your, your transplants are just gonna suffer and they're just not gonna thrive the way that you're hoping and the way that you and they deserve to. So don't forget, hardening off process must happen. So we've been working on this, 10 days to two weeks. The day has arrived, it's planting season. Holy moly me, you and I have been looking for this till the mid, from the middle of winter when we planted our seeds. So we're gonna pick our planting day based on our best judgment on that last frost date information. What we're gonna do is gather our seedling tray together. Let me just make room so I don't accidentally hurt these little guys that I haven't gotten to yet. Come on, little fellows, we're gonna get to you, I promise. Cover your little roots so you don't get dry while I keep talking. Okay, hang on. Let's put you little guys over here. All right, the day has arrived. It's planting time. We go out to our garden and we plant our starts. Let's think about that. The best day to plant, believe it or not, is a rainy, soggy day. Why? Well, these little guys, again, are gonna get sort of, there's something called transplant shock. Kind of, you and I get shocked when we jump into too cold water or, you know, get the fright scared out of us or whatever it is. Transplant shock is a real thing. Taking our plants out and putting them in the garden on a super hot day when they're not acclimated to that. So we want to, again, think about things from our plants' point of view. So the best, the best day is a rainy day, but we don't always get that. The next best choice is a cloudy day, and we don't always get that. The next best choice is then, if it's a warm sunny day, choosing the time at the end of the day so that our little transplants don't have to go through acclimating themselves during the hot heat of that day. So let's pretend we got lucky. It's a cloudy, misty day and we're gonna jump on it and we're gonna go out and we're gonna plant our seedlings. Let's make another thought from our plant's point of view. And let's pretend that this tomato plant, like so many times, has been looking for more light. You've done the best you can, and that's great. Gold star for you. But let's say its little stem is long and lanky. And even if it's not, I apply this too. I go out to my garden bed on the best choice that I can make for transplanting, and I dig a hole for my tomato. I wanna make sure that I fill that hole with water because that water will seep down into the soil and moisten the area where the root ball is. Now think about that. When we water the garden, the water goes from the top down. And these are brand new baby seedlings that just don't have a lot of staying power sometimes. So if we water where that root is gonna be, when we dig that hole and we water that hole inside, then when we place our transplant into that hole and we cover it up and we water from above, we know that at least in the beginning, we've given this little fellow the best opportunity to transplant himself, to do what it's gonna do next, because we've thought about its root system and we've provided moisture in that area. But let's also think about another part of this. If you've got long and lanky tomato starts, why not bury them? It works. Remember, we buried our long lanky stems because all of that that we put under the soil was gonna root, remember? 
The same thing is true again if we've got long, lanky tomato stars. And here's how you can do it, and I'll tell you why we're going to do it this way. Dig a hole. Let's pretend our tomato start is this tall. We're going to dig a hole, and we're going to place it in that hole, and we're going to bury that stem, right? So that it can root and make an even bigger root ball to even provide us more growth up above and more tomatoes later on. But think about the soil, and think about this little plant's needs. We've waited this long to put it in the garden, in part because the soil is now warm enough to give it the habitat that it needs. But if I dig a hole way down deep to plant this little guy so that all of that long stem can be buried, then I've dug a hole down into the cool of the earth, not what this little guy is looking for. So why don't I dig a hole up towards the top of the soil, put water in the hole, and lay him at an angle, bury all of that stem that I can to allow that long lanky stem to root itself. Now you think, yeah, I know, but now my tomato plant is gonna be growing like this. He used to be standing up and now he's all like hanging out. But these things are amazing. I keep telling you, these little fellows know what they're doing. Over the course of a short amount of time, this will right itself and it will grow itself as it needs to grow. But now you have done it a favor, you have buried part of that long lanky stem and given it an opportunity to create even more of a beautiful root system so that it can provide you more food above. Remember, we're always thinking about things from the plant's point of view. All right, that's it. That's it as far as critical steps that we need to take along the way in order to give our seedlings what they need so we can plant them out later in the season in our garden and succeed. There's lots to do after that. And again, you and I can meet up again and cover those tasks later. But this gives you things to do now, lots of things to focus on, and maybe some errors to correct now so that you can still arrive at planting season with beautiful, healthy starts. So what I'd like to do now is open this up to Q&A. And do me a favor, if you have issues with your plants, maybe things are happening, maybe you're seeing things that just don't feel quite right, or things that I've shared with you just don't seem to gel with you, or that's not what's going on in your growing patch. Let's bring those up to the table and let's see if we can't figure out for you and for everybody what might be going on. I hear you. Hi, George. That's a very good question. Thank you for bringing that up. And my answer is no, and I'm gonna tell you why. We've been talking about tomatoes, for example, and, and how they're warm weather and they need warm you know, season to grow and waiting until clear at the end of the season. But onions are a little bit different. They grow in the cool of the spring. And so they're gonna get planted in the garden way earlier than my tomatoes. And I'm up here in like zone three and four, which is cold. My last frost date is the last week of May for warm weather things. But for my onions, I'm going to be able to put these out into the garden in early April. So these little guys are not going to have to stay in the pot, and yours won't either, a whole lot longer. I am going to harden them off the same way I talked about, taking them out to my patio and bringing them back in every day um, for maybe a week or two before I take them out in early April, and you can do the same thing. But the answer would be I'm not going to transplant them because they're not gonna spend as much time in a pot. They're gonna be transplanted out way earlier than my tomatoes are, and they'll be able to do just fine. So, so how about that? How are your onions looking? Okay. Okay, but you, you've started, they're, they're planted, and um, so my guess is, don't worry about it. As soon as they are up and ready, and big enough to go out into the garden in maybe mid-April for you, George, they should be looking good. Okay, yay, you're welcome. Okay, while, oh, while we wait, I wanna give you an idea. We talked about you know, how hard sometimes it is growing our seedlings indoors, giving them a, enough light. 
And we're, we've got a ways to go with our tomato plants, for example, to get them out to the garden. It's, it's still only, well, it's the first day of spring, uh, but there's still a long time left. There is a little structure called a cold frame, and cold frames are nothing new. Generations and generations have used them to create an outdoor early greenhouse experience, which will give your plants the extra light that they may need. And basically, and Google this, this will give you a visual, but basically a cold frame is a box, a wooden box with no lid on it and no bottom on it, just a little frame that you set directly on your ground. And it oftentimes is one of the boards that faces the sun is a little bit lower than the back so that you get the full angle of the sun. And then you take a recycled window, an old window, and you place it over the top. And then basically what you've created is a greenhouse experience that during the day is warm enough and provides extra light for your growing seedlings. But you gotta be on top of this. You can't forget a couple things. One, you can't forget to bring your seedlings in at night because it can still freeze out there inside of that little cold box. And two, it can go on the other end of the spectrum and overheat if you don't prop those windows open. So you have to be super on it and make sure that you're aware of the temperature inside of that box at all times. But it's really easy to make. Often we have all of this material out behind the shed. And so if you think that this would be a way for you to give your seedlings extra light that they're gonna need as we move along, Google a cold frame box and see if that can um, solve some of your issues. Shouldn't cost you hardly anything at all. And I've used them many, many times over the years and they really do work like a dream. So that's a simple do-it-yourself way to provide a, a situation for your plants that you can give them some extra light moving forward. See if that doesn't kind of help you a little bit. All right, Darlene, anybody else that's got some issues we can talk about here today? Yeah, thank you very much. That is a great question and I totally went by that. So before I'm gonna transplant my plants out, and I highly recommend that you do this too, out into the garden row, make sure that you've prepped that bed. And what that means is that if you had anything growing in that bed the year before, that you've sort of gotten rid of all that duff, but that you've also fed that soil so that that soil can feed your plants and then your plants can feed you. I love that little line, but it's so true. And again, that's that symbiotic relationship that exists in the garden. So yes, you wanna make sure that you prep that bed before you plant and put in that soil the fertilizer you're gonna do. If you're using compost from your compost bin, I've learned over the years that that is a good thing to add to your soil, but do it maybe a week or two before you're gonna transplant out so that that compost has a way to start, you know, melding into that soil. Um, if you're gonna fertilize with a, you know, a bagged product, that's great. Do that and water that in before you transplant your little guys out. I think that um, that will really amplify the success you're gonna have. So yes, Linda, that's a really good question. And I definitely feed my soil and prep that bed before I transplant out. You're welcome. Hi, Rob. Wow. Yeah, see, you have it on the other end. Wow.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, Rob, that is so cool. What a great idea. Will you tell us, take us out to your garden and tell us now that we've clipped the tops off those tomatoes, tell us what to expect and how we're gonna see the growth happen there. Wow, this is service, thank you. Okay. Is there anybody who would like to step in Rob's shoes and fill the void while we, while we wait for him to return? This is such a cool thing, look at this. Rob's gonna show us how they're looking. But that's, you know, that's another thing. These plants are amazing. If, they, if we give them the care that they need, they really just produce for us, you know? And that's always blows my mind, the beauty of the garden and our role in it, you know, is really, the caregiver, it's a, it's a win-win deal. And when we can look at it from that point of view, man, everybody wins. And, and we create this beautiful earth and this beautiful way of living and seeing life, you know, that sometimes I think in our modern world, we've kind of left on the side of the road and forgotten about, and it really adds the things we're missing in our lives. So there's my two cents for you. I can hear you. Okay, so let me answer that in two ways and see if I can remember the first part and not forget it. Um, when we start our seedlings, let's remember, we're starting them in a potting, or not in a potting soil, but in a seed starting soil, which is different than potting soil. It's got different ingredients like we talked about. And those ingredients really have been, you know, done that way because they wick moisture away and they are light and fluffy in nature and allow that germinating seed the ultimate possibilities there, okay? That soil is not appropriate for a bigger plant. Now, if we fill, let's say that we're gonna have our tomato plants and move them even again because they're getting big to a gallon size pot and let's say, well, let's just shortcut this whole thing and start a seed in the gallon pot that I'm going to like have it end up in and save myself all of these steps. While that sounds like genius and really the way to go, let's think about this. That would mean that we would start a gallon pot, a seed in a gallon pot in potting soil. And potting soil by its nature holds moisture and it's got a lot of um, organic things in it and material which for a little growing seedling later is what we need but for a germinating seed often is troublesome so there's a lot of possibilities for that seed to uh, kind of experience you know that along the way so I have found that even though there's a couple more steps there's way more success in doing it that way um, and two Let's go back to the seeds that don't like to be potted up and transplanted. And root crops are these. Think about why. Let's look at it from the plant's point of view. A root crop, the crop is the root. And the root does, of a root crop, of a carrot, of a parsnip, of a beet, does not like to be messed with. So if you think about a carrot growing its seed, popping out of the ground, that is gonna send down a root a long root, because think about how long a carrot is, right? It's gonna start sending its root down and that's gonna become the carrot. Anytime I'm gonna mess with that root, I'm sort of like messing with my carrot. And to move that from a pot, that carrot root from a pot, that plant, into the soil, now I put it in a hole and swoosh the soil up around it and now my beautiful carrot is gonna be like messed with and crumply and various things. It's just far easier and more successful to start all of our root crops directly in the soil when our seed packet suggests to us that planting time is right. And, and this is what I wanna leave you with today, really. The, if I could leave you with one thing, this is it. The answers are there. 
we just need to interpret what the plant is telling us. And I know it's not gonna like speak to me. I mean, even I know that, but it is giving cues and it is, it is in, a, in a sense communicating. We just have to learn how to interpret that and how to know what that is you know, being said, what's being told to us. And that's a skill that we're gonna develop as our garden seasons go along. I've learned an awful lot and I've killed my share of seedlings, I guarantee you. But more and more and more, even I am beginning to see, gosh, I guess that's what that little guy is telling me. And, and it really turns out to be true a lot of times. Mistakes, never a mistake, only a learning opportunity. But really there are a lot of cues that our plants will share with us. And just do your best, interpret it how you think it is, roll with it if it's a mistake okay i misinterpreted you i'm so sorry i won't do that again but um but never give up never stop because this is a skill that is so so important so important to share with everybody that you love every kid that you ever run across in this world every neighborhood kid anybody who is interested in growing food share with them what you've learned because it is a really important skill and you and i have been through hopefully we're done. We've been through a, a section of time where things occurred to us that maybe we thought we would never have to deal with. And one of those things is, you know, the availability of garden seeds, the availability of food itself, and the ability that we have, the knowledge base that exists in each and every one of us to grow our food. It's a, it's a critical survival skill without being paranoid or anything. It's really important that at least we understand the essentials and we may not be growing our food, we may, may not be growing our garden, but at least we understand how that happens. So if we needed to, we could. So I highly suggest too, highly suggest, as you guys are going down the garden path this year, and we'll have a class later on in the season when the time is right for this, but think about seed saving and, and how you can learn to capitalize on these beautiful little fellows whose goal, let us not remember, is to bear seed for the next generation. Let us give back to the garden by learning to become a seed saver so that we can gather the seed, allow that plant to achieve its goal, and have the garden seeds that we need for next year's garden. So, part of the whole story too. Is Rob back yet? All right, let's see. Rob, that is so cool. I never would have thought of that, but it makes total sense when you think about it from the plant's point of view, right? Tomatoes want to like root themselves and grow more of themselves. And look at there, there is a great way that that can happen. Super cool. Ever, ever. I love that tomato. I remember when you and I grew some of those together. Very cool. And, and you know, Rob has brought up another really important part is when you are choosing your garden seeds, open pollinated seeds mean just that. They're open pollinated. You can save those seeds year after year and you will get, now there's some, some you know, specifics around this, but you will get that particular plant grown from that seed. Um, the seed industry offers other things, hybrids and genetically modified seeds and all sorts of stuff that are not an open pollinated seed. If you want to become a seed saver, you need to be clear when you purchase your seed packets that it's an open pollinated variety. And like I said, we'll have seed saving opportunities later on in the season, but it just is a, you know, a good place to start for now. But Rob, thank you so much. Good to see you and I appreciate that info today. Um, you should be able to buy them almost anywhere, but let's pretend, let you're striking out. Let's pretend we live on Mars or something. And um, one of the things that you can use is a plastic cup. Uh, poke some holes in the bottom. I've used tin cans and poke some holes in the bottom. I've used, I don't know, yogurt containers that I had under my sink waiting to go to the recycle center. So if you strike out and you can't find these four inch pots, and this is a good size, take note of that. 
what do you have around that's recycled that is approximately the same size, doesn't have to be perfect, but that's gonna give your plants room for the roots to grow in a bigger container as it grows up in size. So, so that's what I found. I, I don't have any here, I'd give them to you, but, um, but hardware stores often, nursery centers, you can check that. But if you strike out, just find something recycled that you think will work, anything. Good question. What do you want to learn about next? I won't put it on your shoulders. Uh-huh. What's that? Okay, email me. But um, one of the things that I do have in the hopper, and it'll probably be in the next couple weeks, because this is coming along for a lot of us, is um, many of us have outdoor patio spots, and many of us have patio containers. And I have gotten super creative about how to use those containers at a really early time in the season to grow some of my early greens. And so if you're into growing lettuces or kales or pak choys or bok choys or what else do I have started over there? Arugula, a lot of these early greens that can take some of this cool weather still is happening on my porch, but we can take advantage of this early shoulder season before the soil in our gardens is ready and warm up some pots on the patio instead and use that for a grow space to grow some of these really luscious early greens that I know we're all just like craving. So I think that's gonna probably be the next one, how to use our patios. We'll come up with some sweet little title, but, um, but it'll be growing some greens in our patio. So I know that's in the hopper coming at us. And then my goal is, my, my hope for us, is as the garden season unfolds, to, and, and it's unfolding in my garden, I, and I am um, a girl who really takes seriously growing her food. I don't grow all of my food, but I grow an awful lot of it. And so what I like to do is use my garden, show you what I'm up to, and, and let you see how it's possible to use some spaces creatively, because I'm a girl, a DIY girl, I tell you that. My garden looks a little um, like a jungle, but it functions and it functions for some critical reasons that I'm always very happy to share. And so I like to use that as I walk through the garden season with you, creating um, tutorials and videos and um, teaching what to do next along the garden path. Because there's a lot of things that can happen and a lot of things that we still need to do before harvest season at the end. And so I've just found that it's a very useful tool. So stay tuned, stay on this email list and you'll hear about what's coming as spring unfolds and we actually get out to the vegetable garden. And if you could do me a favor and be a sweet pea, if you have friends or family that are learning to garden too, please share this information with them, okay? I really do believe that the more of us at a garden party, the better. And if we're gonna do that, this, there's no reason why we can't just grow the room size and have more of us taking advantage of, um, well, of my 25 years of growing experience, but also from you, from your questions and what you are learning along the way. So um, we're just sort of creating a beautiful garden community here together and learning how to grow our food. So that's, that's kind of what's coming down the pike for all of us. Yay. Any more questions in the gallery today? Any issues that you're having on your vegetable starts? I'm going to assume you're doing miraculously. This is great. And just remember, always look through things through the eyes of the veggie starts if you can. Through the eyes of whatever it is that you are encountering in the garden. And let me show you what I mean by that. Here's, here's a story, just so you can see that, wow, how, how far I've come. Years ago, I had this beautiful flower growing in my um, perennial beds. It was a, a globe thistle, and it had these beautiful, well, it's still growing there. It has these beautiful, round, globe flowers on it that attract every pollinator in the neighborhood. And one day I went out to this beautiful flowering shrub and I looked at it and it was covered I mean covered in little bitty caterpillar looking fellows and it was early and I was like ah this thing is like infested I gotta come out here and I gotta cut this down which was my intention but 
things happened and you know, I got sidetracked, thank goodness. Because a couple days later, it may have been longer than a couple days, a few days later, I came back, you know, shears in hand, getting ready to cut this. And I realized that what I had seen and, and interpreted as a pest, as something that was danger, was actually the caterpillar stage of an endangered butterfly. And here it was feasting on the nectar and the pollen in my garden. I was gonna destroy it because it was something that I thought I knew about. But when I could step back and see it for what it truly was from its perspective, I realized the error of my way. And I try to apply that in my own garden, year after year after year. When I see things, when I encounter something that I don't understand, I try to like step back and not be in charge and dictating, but to step back and try to interpret it from the perspective of the garden. So see if you can't do that too. It really, it really has added an entire element of success to my gardening career, and I'm sure it's gonna do the same for you too. I think that might be some really good words to end on, right? Success for everybody. I want to thank you guys so much for showing up here today, for supporting the work that I do, and really for being open to learning about this skill called growing your own food. You take care out there, never give up. We've got a long way to go. We're gonna be able to meet again and tackle the issues that are coming at us. Lots to do, lots to talk about. I care about you tons. I love you, you take care. We'll see each other next time, okay? Bye-bye.